on all keyboard instruments. I've had extensive training uh, with piano, organ, and harpsichord. I had a little bit of exposure to the clavichord because anyone who goes through the Stanford University programs and performance practices will learn a great deal about all of the keyboard instruments. I I lived in quite a few different places, and I've lived in the San Francisco Bay Area, and that's actually the area in which the largest segment of my life uh, has been centered, and I've lived in North Germany, in Lübeck, when I had my Fulbright grant. So I've lived in quite a few different places, and then also for seven years in the Washington, D.C. area when I was in school and my father was working for the government. He was a Naval Research Contract Administration official, and so he was in Washington for a while, and then we... Um, moved to San Francisco when he took over uh, leadership of the Western Region Office of the New York Office of Naval Research. But while in Virginia, I was oh, age 7 to 13, and when I was quite young, I couldn't have been more than 8 or 9 or so, uh, I remember going to the church we attended, which is a Methodist church in Falls Church, Virginia. It was 
white. Everything was white. Uh, the exterior, interior, everything was painted white, and it was very New England uh, in style. And I still remember walking in one morning with my parents. The double doors were thrown open, uh, and this torrent of organ music was coming down the center aisle. Uh, and I just stood there and said to myself, this I want to do. Never questioned it for a moment in any way whatsoever, and I've just absolutely loved it ever since and always will. I was very small at the time for playing something like a pipe organ, uh, but I did start with organ training at the age of nine, and I was a very tiny nine-year-old. Only about an inch of my posterior was Velcroed to the bench, and so <laughs> I developed a good way of balancing myself so that I could do pedal work. But I progressed very quickly, and by the time I was 13, I was beginning to do memorized recitals as a concert organist, and that is, of course, very early for the organ. I've also had piano training, and I did Beethoven sonatas and Chopin etudes and all kinds of other literature. And uh, with every keyboard instrument, though, I've had a focus on contemporary music and music by living composers. I was already performing a lot of Messiaen, um, 20th century composers by the time I was in my late teens. When I had my years of study at Stanford, I remained for a number of reasons. I know traditional wisdom has a student completing a bachelor's degree and then possibly moving to a different university for the master's and maybe a, a third place for the doctorate. I remained for all three degrees. Uh, because Professor Herbert Nanny, the uh, long-time, long-term professor of organ there, uh, had a program that put equal emphasis on early music performance practices, the early fingerings and pedalings for the works of J.S. Bach and uh, his predecessors, as well as a lot of focus on contemporary music and music by living composers, and he was excellent at encouraging creativity. So when I started to emphasize composition equally with organ, he was very much in favor of that. And the composition faculty was extremely strong at Stanford. Leland Smith, uh, the head of the program, who along with Pierre Boulez, instituted the IRCAM, I-R-C-A-M. It's a center for research in music and acoustics uh, in France. And it's quite well known, and it's an absolute center of uh, contemporary music creation and research. So at any rate, Leland Smith was a tremendous professor of composition, and I would never be able to calculate how much I learned from him. And everything sort of fell into place, and the organ is a marvelous instrument for a composer. Uh, it was Olivier Messiaen's own primary instrument, and J.S. Bach, and Maurice Duraflay, uh, quite a long list, actually. So uh, it's kind of a long and time-honored tradition. Uh, another great love of mine is the alto saxophone, but you can't do the same type of contrapuntal uh, gymnastics with that instrument. But uh, anyway, I just never wavered once I discovered it. This song cycle is hybrid in genre. Uh, and, of course, as a classical musician, I could use the word postmodern, but it combines so many influences. Classical art song, New York cabaret, jazz, pop, Argentinian tango, um, all kinds of different influences. Uh, the words and the music mostly arrived, you know, as, as a unit. I mean, as I mentioned in the program notes for the disc, the materials for the text and the musical materials generally arrived, is the word I would choose, simultaneously. I had not thought of its potential as a wedding song, and of course as an organist and pianist I've certainly played lots of weddings, and certainly there would always be a song would be ideal for that, and that never for a second occurred to me. Uh, that essentially is a pop song. It also can be defined as a classical song, but uh, it was the first one of the entire set of 16. Then the second one became the title song, uh, the one called Haven. Oh, hi. 
Catherine has had extensive and very fine classical training. She appears on recommendation because she is extremely fine uh, across a lot of genres, and she did things that intersected with fields such as opera and art song. But in her ongoing career, she does a lot of work with pop and jazz and even certain branches of rock. She's very easy to work with. She learns very quickly. She has an excellent sense of pitch and a beautiful voice. She does work uh, primarily in the non-classical genres. But when I had her go over, there would always be a song, which is the first one we recorded. I knew instantly that she was my singer, and we have worked together ever since. The business card that they had printed for me says Professor of Organ Diagonal Slash Music Theory, but I'm also active uh, in the area of composition, and I sometimes supervise doctoral minors in composition, uh, but I regularly teach the counterpoint courses. 16th century counterpoint and 18th century counterpoint. And I enjoy those courses more than I could possibly describe. And of course, counterpoint uh, is a foundation of composition. When one is teaching species counterpoint uh, in the 16th century style, there is uh, a regular pattern that unfolds and you progress through the species and you're teaching students how uh, to deal with this discipline and how to create music uh, in the style of composers such as Palestrina, Morley, Victoria. It's quite exacting. There are many rules, but it's also high art. And it's tremendously exciting when a student in a 2016 classroom can produce music that truly sounds like Palestrina. It's just indescribably exciting. And it affects all aspects of that student's development as a composer and even as a performer. I've had people come to me subsequently and say, Dr. Decker, I've never forgotten what I learned in that class. It has affected everything. I don't even see my performance scores in the same way anymore. Uh, my understanding of everything that I'm doing is vastly expanded. The thing that is most exciting is that it's the same as when someone suddenly realizes 
how a house is constructed. Really exciting to understand how a structure gains and retains its integrity, why it works and becomes a work of art. Because of that, I just love that aspect of my activities. Uh, and I love teaching composition. I like to enter into the student's style and do the best I can to discern where that student is going. There is a voice that develops, and I realize that's a bit of a cliche in terminology when we speak about a composer having, quote unquote, a voice. When a student is developing individuality and style, it's a very personal thing. And I try to help the molecules of that style come together and adhere in a certain sort of way that uh, makes that the individual direction the student wishes to take and not just a Xerox copy of the professor's way. My students have turned out to have widely differing styles and I've worked with people who write for all different types of combinations and instruments and ensembles and voices and so all of this uh, is a direct feed into what I do myself as a composer because often I'll demonstrate what I might do with material and then I demonstrate many other possibilities for how the student can work with material like being in a gym and doing one's own routines I find that teaching this material is a little bit like doing a few more uh, floor exercise routines in the gym. Uh, and it's tremendously helpful to what one does. So I find it interactive with what I do myself creatively and supportive, definitely not distracting at all, you know, quite the contrary. Uh, and I just love it. It's more symbolic in nature. Uh, it is tied to many concepts and influences. Uh, Superman is an interesting figure uh, in that, of course, uh, he is supposed to be from the planet Krypton, uh, where he was initially given the name Kal-El, uh, K-A-L-E-L. And the suffix L is something that appears as a part of the names of angels, typically, as in Gabriel, Michael, uh, things like that. And actually, the whole concept of Superman has been taken up by a lot of scholars who work with Christian concepts and, and also Jewish history and concepts. And there's the whole idea of the similarity between a superhero and the concept of something like uh, an angel, as described in the Bible. Uh, and in both cases, uh, these are beings with superpowers who are able to work on behalf of good and justice uh, for people who do not have power to act on their own behalf. And so leadership figures can be seen as um, having a parallel to this sort of thing. Uh, oh, someone maybe even like Gandhi or uh, someone like Mother Teresa or, you know, any sort of leadership figure, maybe even a person in history like Albert Schweitzer or, incidentally, it was an organist. Uh, but, um, you know, it's more of a symbolic type of thing. And also, if you look at the song Haven, and even there would always be a song, there is a sort of a leitmotiv type of theme running through the entire cycle that refers to the power of an individual person to have uh, a healing or helping effect on another person. Joy. 
I first met him at the San Anselmo Organ Festival in the Marin County area of um, California in 1986 when he was the primary featured artist at that festival. He had an absolutely spectacular recital there as one of the main featured evening events. And this program included lots of marvelous contemporary music, including absolutely incredible work by the composer Christopher Rouse, who was a close friend of his. And we all jumped up as one in a standing ovation that must have gone on for nearly 10 minutes, because this Christopher Rouse piece is probably the most challenging thing in the entire uh, organ literature, and the performance was something we all knew uh, we would never forget. And then I met him at that point, and we hit it off very well. And the director of the festival was at the time uh, a woman named Sandra Soderlund, who literally wrote the book on organ technique uh, that sort of braids it into other technical methods for other keyboard instruments. And she approached me one evening on a boat that we had for the conference that was, was sort of an evening event with a cruise on the water. And she said, I don't think you realize it, but Bill is after you. <laughs> And uh, we were at a time in life when each one of us was uh, sort of between relationships, and and we did develop a very close relationship and end up marrying on July 9th of 1994. And we were married for approximately four and a half years, and he passed away then uh, in 1998. He was my biggest advocate, and I was his biggest advocate. We had a tremendous meeting of the minds uh, as artists. We differed a good deal. I never did anything with electronic music or with prepared tapes, and he had, and uh, he did some things with unconventional methods of notation, which I never took up. We had no difficulty maintaining our widely differing individual styles, but being in a state of admiration uh, for each other and uh, being able to discuss works in very helpful and stimulating ways. And we loved each other very deeply, and that was always in the picture and always the case. We just had a fantastic time. And I will always consider that um, he had one of the truly remarkable minds I have ever encountered in my life. If you were to visit my Facebook page, you would notice that the entire page has gone totally and thoroughly to the dogs. I take any chance I get to advocate for animals. Uh, the household does include 10 dogs and one cat named Emily, as in Emily Dickinson. They, they're not all in the house. There is a workshop in the family that has a large fenced yard and what sort of is a dog apartment that is actually a structure with nice amenities to it. But uh, there's been some activity with fostering and rescuing. Ken is the exact amount for which care can be promised at the highest possible level, so it never goes above that. I am a huge dog fanatic, but, but I love all animals. 